So we're going to go ahead and clean up some of the damage that we've done so quickly by attempting to illustrate how to create super users within MySQL. We have a few accounts or four accounts, so several accounts that we need to clean up. We need to get rid of percent percent, Linux CBT percent, coffee percent, and blank percent, the most dangerous of the four. There are different ways to delete accounts, including using the delete SQL statement or simply using the drop user MySQL statement. Let's show you how to use the latter. We're logged in as a privileged user in this window without the grant option, by the way. This user, if you notice when we execute it, show grants, we'll do it again, does not have the grant privilege. So you may be wondering, can a user who does not have the ability to grant new permissions drop a user? Well, let's go ahead and attempt to drop user. In this case, let's drop the user coffee. And that's specified as drop user space coffee. And notice the number of rows that were affected returns zero. Well, let's rerun the select user host password from mysql.user and notice that the coffee account's gone. What this tells you is that you don't need to have the ability to grant new permissions to new users or to elevate anyone's permissions to be able to drop users. You simply need the equivalent of most of the permissions to delete users, including the delete capability. Our current user has the ability to delete users, not necessarily to grant new permissions, but to delete existing users. In a large environment, you may want to define a group or maybe at least one, perhaps even two users who have the sole ability of user management or sole capability to manage users within your DBMS, perhaps to delete or to create and or delete. Great. So let's go ahead and clean up the additional users, the delete or the drop space user function makes deleting users very easy. So to delete users use drop and we'll put this in uppercase here drop user followed by user command and for example drop user and we drop the user coffee which basically got rid of that user for us. Well, let's copy this into memory and paste it into the terminal monitor. By the way, we could specify multiple commands on the same line. So we could go ahead and drop Linux CBT. And you may be wondering about the case where we have a blank user. Let's get rid of Linux CBT. Rerun the query. Now we're left with blank and percent. So you're wondering if we have just drop user space semicolon, will it work? doesn't work. How about with two single quotes? Does it work? Well, let's show select user and you'll see it's gone. So if you have a, a user who is undefined, such as the anonymous user, you can do it the way we showed you prior, which is to actually delete the user from the user table, or just use drop user space or drop space user space, single quote, close single quote, and then terminate the line with a semicolon. As mentioned, you can perform many of these functions on the same line by just separating the statements using semicolons. So we could drop user 1, then drop user 2, all on the same line without having to type things in serially. But you're going to learn a lot of different ways you can get data in and out and manipulate the terminal monitor throughout our studies. So this is all just a warm-up. Let's get rid of the percent user. Drop user percent instead of ampersand. We hit the wrong key there. And let's take a look at the new user table. The new user table permits only root from the local host as well as root from Linux CBT DB1. Now always confirm your changes. Never ever just drop users or perform these types of functions without doing some sort of follow-up to ensure that your security measures have been committed similar to what we showed you earlier with flushing privileges. Now we do have a session here on the remote system, Linux CBT Media 1. Let's attempt to connect as a fictitious user called T with a password of XYZ123. And notice it doesn't let us in. Let's try with ABC123. We're not able to get in. Let's try to get in as a different user. This time as the user Linux CBT, which is a user we specified using XYZ123. We're not able to get in. And let's try it again using ABC123. 
This tells us that the drop user feature actually flushes privileges. So note, drop user, and we'll include this within single quotes, performs a grant table, we'll say tables flush, or flush privileges for us. So rather than having to do it the way we did before, it's done for us, so privileges. Let's include flush space privileges between single quotes. And that's one of the neat features of using drop space users, that the grant tables are flushed, or the in-memory representation of the grant tables are flushed. Now again, for efficiency, for speed, MySQL stores the users and passwords and hosts that are permitted access to the server in memory rather than consulting the disk each time. Since even if you did have thousands of users, let's say you had in a large enterprise environment 300,000 users defined in your MySQL database instance. Let's say it was a monster cluster set up with max DB and so on. Doesn't matter. 300,000 usernames, passwords, and other accompanying information that you can reveal using describe for the user table isn't much information to store in today's modern systems. Whereas the actual data in the user tables would not be able to fit within the limitations of nowadays hardware. Even if you had a large system with let's say 64 gigabytes of RAM, data sets can easily be hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes, and wouldn't fit inside of RAM whereas user accounts store much fewer information and can easily fit into random access memory. Great, so those users are gone. Now what else do we want to do? We want to be able to create users, specific users, users who are granted access from a specific system. We still have a window open to a host called Linux CBT Media 1. That's the host name. We can reveal its full name. It's Linux CBT Media 1 dot our internally made up suffix. How do we permit a user from this remote system to log in as any name that we wish? We could create the name as root or any other name. Let's begin with root. So the object of this section is or task create users who are permitted remote access from Linux CBT Media 1. How do we go about doing it? Well, first we want to create a user called root, just for simplicity. That's all. And just to also show you that root at Linux CBT DB1, which is our local host where we're doing the majority of our studies, differs from root at localhost, which will also differ, who will also differ from root at Linux CBT Media 1. So let's go ahead and create that user. Let's confirm who we are by executing a select user. We always want to know who we are to determine whether or not we have full privileges or at least grant privileges to create these new rights. And we could use a create user followed by grant or just use grant. I think it's easier to use the grant command simply for backwards compatibility and the fact that it takes care of assigning privileges all in one shot. So let's go ahead and grant all privileges on star dot star. And by the way, this is a definite liberal way or the widest way to open up access to a given user. Realistically, when you grant access to a user from a remote system, you're going to grant access to one or more databases, not to all databases on the system. But when learning any technology, it's always great to start wide with a macro view and then narrow in. So if you grant to start out star, then it's easy to subtract or to scale back. So we'll grant all privileges, although some security-minded folks take the opposite approach, which is grant only what's necessary and then append. We'll do that as well. Grant all privileges on star dot star to a new user who we've yet to define, but we'll call this user root. And the reason why we're doing this is because we're logged in currently on remote system as root, so it saves us one extra step. And again, to differentiate between the two root users defined, root at Linux CBT Media One identified by an in between single quotes password or a password that we want to use. 
Let's go with a password of nice teeth, followed by a semicolon. So now we have a new user called root at Linux CBT Media 1. When we execute a select user host password from mysql.user, here's the new user. Totally different user. Remember, this is a SQL table. So MySQL isn't treating any of these of, as being related to the Linux operating system in any way at all. We need to last but not least confirm that we can log in as root at Linux CBT Media 1. But this is all contingent upon proper name resolution. So whenever you define a user at a given host, ensure that the host is resolvable by, my, by MySQL. And MySQL will cache the host name so that subsequent authentication attempts occur as rapidly as possible. So keep that in mind as well. So from the remote system, let's clear screen, clear screen that is, we're on Linux CBT Media 1, let's re-execute a MySQL host, Linux CBT DB1. And if we specify the right password, in this case, nice teeth, we should be able to connect to Linux CBT DB1. But notice, the local MySQL client returns that root at the IP address is not permitted, which tells us that the remote system thinks that we're coming from an IP address and not from a host name. And there are many reasons why this could be, and it's all tied to name resolution. Let's quit to a shell, and we will attempt to ping Linux CBT Media 1. Let's see what happens when we do. Notice the remote system has no clue who Linux CBT Media 1 is, and why could that be? Well, if we SU into the system, and take a brief look using Pico since Nano isn't installed at etc hosts we'll see that there isn't an entry in the hosts file now certainly in an enterprise environment you're not going to maintain hosts files for all of these for all of your various systems your all of your managed systems you will use DNS we're using hosts files because it's quick and dirty in your environment if it's large use DNS but just ensure that DNS kept up to date Let's create an entry, 192.168.1.100, and call it Linux CBT Media 1.LinuxCBT.internal, which is the long name, followed by Linux CBT Media 1 as its short name or abbreviated name. Now the server knows who Linux CBT Media 1 is. We can confirm as such by sending some ICMP packets. So let's ping sending two ICMP packets, Linux CBT Media 1, and it knows who the host is. Let's also attempt to re-log in to the remote system. Notice the big difference here. MySQL running on the server has extracted the fully qualified domain name, which is its default behavior, which tells us something. The way that we created the username is considered incorrect or non-internet standard or not fully qualified. So this tells us that when creating users, use FQDN when creating users for remote access and or IP address. The reason why you, you tend to want to include an IP address or an IP followed by a subnet is in the event that name resolution breaks down, the user can still get into the system. So it's very important that you do both. So you want to create two users, one with the fully qualified domain name and another at the IP address. So on the local system, let's MySQL back in and we'll authenticate, of course, using ABC123, which is the current password and we'll select user host password from MySQL. We can specify database name dot table name and you'll see that root at Linux CBT Media 1 is defined but not root at Linux CBT Media 1 dot Linux CBT dot internal. Had we altered the hosts file on the local system to not include the fully qualified domain name it would have worked. But that isn't proper syntax. It isn't the proper nomenclature. So let's redefine the user using the grant statement, which should be somewhere in our history. And if it isn't, we'll just retype it in. We'll grant all privileges on all databases, all tables to a user called Linux CB, or in this case, it's root, not Linux CBT, root at Linux CBT Media 1 
dot Linux CVT dot internal identify by the same password. Let's go with XYZ123 with no grant options. And then let's rerun the query, which dumps all the users. Now we have four users. From the remote system, let's attempt to connect yet again. And in fact, we have the wrong password. No big deal, we'll just change it here. Or we should try to connect with an incorrect password. Notice, bad password. Let's try it with the correct password, this time being XYZ123. And finally, we're able to connect. So when we execute a select current user, open close paren, you see that we're logged in as root at Linux CBT Media 1 dot Linux CBT dot internal because the fully qualified domain name was extracted from the target system's host file upon authentication. That's MySQL's preference. But it always helps to have a backup account user account that is with identical privileges which equates to the user's IP address in the event that name resolution breaks down. So that is the suggestion. So as a result, create an identical user at instead, or in addition, not instead, 192.168.1.100 which happens to be the IP address. So that in the event that name resolution breaks down, we're good to go. Now let's force name resolution to break down. We'll return to the shell by using this time a backslash Q as the escape sequence. We'll modify etc, and again we don't have nano, etc hosts, and we'll simply comment out the last option included or inserted into the file, forcing name resolution to break down, and then we'll follow that up by attempting to ping sending three ICMP packets to Linux CBT Media 1, which because ARP, it's still in the ARP cache, it works. And that's only because it's in ARP. However, when the ARP cache is cleared, which we can easily clear, then it'll actually fail. Here's the 100 that's still in the, the ARP cache. Let's run here an ARP help. And you'll see that if we want to delete a specific entry, we'll just use the dash D option. So let's ARP D 192.168.1.100. Let's rerun ARP to see what's in the cache. It's incomplete. Then let's attempt to ping sending three packets to media one. Now it doesn't know the host. So let's rerun ARP and it's been cleared. From the remote system, we'll quit backslash Q and then attempt to connect yet again using the proper password. And then we'll execute a select current user and we're connected yet again. But the remote system no longer knows who Linux CBT Media One is it accepts the connection based on the IP address because the account's there. Now had we removed the IP address account information which is the additional account then the connection would have failed. So whenever possible define two accounts. So create a user use the fully qualified as well as the IP address. So note define two users for failover or name resolution breakdown and you'll find that this is a common way MySQL set up not specific to version 5 per se but just in general because name resolution can't always be counted on and you do not want to be denied access to your database just because the DNS server or the host file has been hosed for whatever reason. So having said that, we're going to look at some other ways we can authenticate and make use of the MySQL terminal monitor. There's so much more to look at.